Right, welcome to the Shake Ram Rule uh, podcast, episode three. Uh, I'm Richard Shaw and I'm joined today with one of the Welsh MMA pioneers, uh, Mike Edwards. Um, Mike's been on the circuit a long, long time. He's somebody that, you know, I really wanted to get uh, some perspectives about, about the Welsh MMA scene and different things on. So really pleased to have you on, Mike. How are you doing, mate? You all right? Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on, Shake. Pleasure. No problem, no problem at all, but, um, you know, what, what, what? What I'm trying to do, but in this times of madness, is just give people some uh, some insight into some of the the original the original guys that were on the scene, you know, right through to the, the you know the guys that's in the USC now. And it's nice for you know some of the newbies to have a look at the history of uh, of where the sport began and and the guys like yourself and Jenkins and others that have brought it to this point, pretty much, mate. You know, so start off with this, the question I always start off on, mate. You know, what age did you get into martial arts and and, and what was your first start? Um, I got into martial arts at about eight, nine years old, and it was judo. It was my my first martial art. Um, so, was that was that something you wanted to do? Or was it a case of the usual thing with the family? You had a bit of a tear away, and they tried to keep you occupied. Yeah, my mother put me into it basically. Yeah. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did enjoy it. Yeah, as it was. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 you're a black belt in judo now, Mike, so obviously that's something you've done all your life then, is it? Or have you had a bit of a hiatus from it and gone back to it? Um, done it for a couple of years as a kid. Yeah. Uh, but I moved away to Manchester then, so I got kind of drawn away from it. Um, and then touched on it then, back, you know, later on in life. And uh, obviously got my black belt then. Further, wait, further wait, on wait. Well, did, did you move to Manchester as a kid, Mike? Or? As a kid, yeah, when I was like, like 10, 11 years old. How long was you up there for? Uh, I was only up there for a year, year and a half. And then back up, back. Where, where are you from at the moment? Is, is it Swansea or is it Mike Steg you're from? Mike right? Steg I'm from, Mike yeah. So move back to, my, you know, in Mike Steg, Manchester, back to Mike Steg or different parts? Yeah, my mum, I uh, come from a broken background, I did. And uh, my mum moved me away to, to Manchester. Um, didn't have great experiences up there. Um, so uh, she sent me down my old man for six weeks holidays. And obviously running around with your friends, playing fox around, rugby, football up the river, and I had, you know, much better experience. Ask could I, li- you know, live with my own man, like, and, uh, uh, that's, and that's what happened been then. It, been there since, yeah. So yeah, grew up, grew up pretty much with your dad, yeah, in my state. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Hey, you just said about rugby, and I, I mean, you know, obviously you're a, a very competent martial art. Any other sports that you were involved in as a youngster or as an adult? Yeah, I played rugby for twenty years. Yeah? Yeah. Who do you play for? Played for, well, uh, all the teams on the Valleys, Nanty, Mike Stay, Celtic, two teams like. What position? Uh, up beside flank and inside I had, fe- I had a feeling we were going to say back row then. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. yeah so what, what was the crack with it? Um, enjoyed it, but, you know, your heart was set on, on martial arts more as a, uh, I, as a it, mainstay? It basically came down to, uh, it was too much of a dick on the field, really. Getting sent uh, off all the time? Too much fight then, yeah. <laughs> any, any there, any any scaffolds I was running in, I'm, I'm gonna go like. Yeah, well, you know, I, I come from a rugby community as well. Lots of you know, my wife's family and I all, all good common rugby, and uh, huge change in rugby. Do you know what I mean? What, what you would get away with twenty years ago, you know, used to be uh, uh, common. You like go and watch the local sides, and you'd be guaranteed to be a couple of scraps. But I think. Um, Particularly at the higher level now, with the the video refs and everything else, it, it's stamped that out now. I do what think I was, this is what it. I was, <laughs> what I was doing, I'd be doing jail time for now. <laughs> Fair play, man. So, done rugby, um, judo. What what drew you into martial arts? What mixed martial arts? What age was you when you got involved? You know, and started training a, a bit of cross training with you know boxing, kickboxing, judo, and jujitsu, and thought, you know what, I'm going to give this MMA a crack. Uh, th- 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 I was life was hard when I was about eleven years old, and believe it or not, I I was on the terms of committing suicide at, at eleven, and uh, I come across a gym, a weights gym, and me and my mates was in the gym, and uh, in the gym there was a, a ring in the corner, and out out of the doorway came a man called Billy Priest. I don't know where you've heard of him. Is that Carl? Yeah. Is he something to do with Carl Priest from He's my state? His father, yeah. I remember Carl. Carl. Carl done a few MMA fights back in the day. I remember being yeah. on the St. Carter's Carl. I think he fought. Um, like, did he fight Kevin Cox back in the day? Yeah, that's right. They're on the was he on a grappling strike? Grappling, yeah, he fought. I fought on a St. Carter's Carl on one of the grappling strikes. He was a tough little, 
Let's have a little bit. Have you heard a few stories about his old man being a tough nut as well? So uh, his, old man's in, his old man's in uh, street fighting box. He's, yeah, uh, that's right. I've read him. Yeah. yeah, with Malcolm so Price, that type of character. He comes out of the room and me and my mates are messing about in the ring and he says, first one to draw blood gets two pounds. And we're all like, oh, all right, here we go. So we're all swinging and, you know, going at it. And he, he um, actually took me to the side and said that I had potential then, like. Yeah. And um, he let me train side by side with him and was showing me kicks and how to hit the speedball and, and different things like that. But um, moving on from that, I was working down the gen on the doors and... Uh, a little uh, situation started, and a guy called Stuart Owells. Do you know Stuart Owells? He, traditional jiu-jitsu black belt? Traditional jiu-jitsu, that's it, I yeah. Remember. yeah, yeah. So we're on, I'm on the door next to him, and this big, massive guy comes running at him, and he holds him in this lock on the on the front door, and this guy's gone limp-like. Yeah. So I'm, afterwards then, I was like, what, can I, what did you do to him? Like, he said, oh, it's traditional jiu-jitsu. He said, just come down. So I, I went down and I uh, started training. That's when I got into traditional jiu-jitsu then. Yeah, Any anybody that, you know... You're still training with now at the, at the gym then? Um, no, I know uh, I know Kerry Jones uh, from Bridgend. Who from Bridgend, trained, uh, I don't I don't train with him, but I see he's, he's still going. Yeah, he's got his own gym, Kerry, hasn't he? But, but then um, I got invited to go to uh, you know the House of Pain shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first House of Pain show, uh, me still went and two other guys bodyguarding some guy. I don't know why we were bodyguarding him. I don't know what, what was so special about this guy. But uh, we were watching the show, the first House of Pain show, and um, Mark Jordan, the, the guy who was running it, comes over and he asks us, yeah. he asks us, do you, do you fancy I want to go with this? So I was like, fucking right, I'll fucking have a go in it. So I didn't, have, I didn't have a clue what to do, but it was like, on the next show, I was matched to get on the next show. So that's 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 basically how I got into it then. So was that your MME debut? That was my MME debut, yeah, 2005. So, so what was you doing? He was doing a bit of kickboxing with, with Billy Priest, was it? Jiu-Jitsu? That's not with... a bit of kickboxing. It wasn't long, like, but um, yeah. mainly taught me mentality, Billy. You know, yeah. tough man mentality. Yeah, yeah. A uh, bit of traditional Jiu-Jitsu for a couple of months, and then into the cage, and straight, straight off. Straight in the deep end. So no, no amateur fights, Mike, you know, straight in. First fight was pro, and, yeah, and yeah, pro, straight through, pro straight through. Um, funny enough, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, did you fight Amos? So we, we, we've crossed that off. Who, who, was, um, who was your first pro fight against? And, and uh, how old was you, Mike, at the time? Um, I was 20. And it was... What was his name? Uh, oh, I could probably get it up. I got the, the shoe dog up. No, it's not on there. It's not on there, is it? Oh. I was going to ask you, you're 7-3 and three on shoe dog. Is that, is that the correct record? Yeah, or is it fight 10, 10 and 4. 10 and 4, so fights that haven't been recorded off different shows on there, yeah? Yeah, MMA Universe, I did it all, but I don't know why. Yeah, should, yeah. Should they, 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 they were a good database, to be honest, Mike, and um, when they closed the site down, I think they'd done the, the, the MMA scene a bit of a disservice by not allowing somebody to, to have the records or whatever, because there's yeah. lots of fights, you know, they had every single fight I had recorded on, on MMA Universe, and, and it's probably ones I couldn't even remember now if I tried to think back to, you know. Oh, so you I couldn't get them on Sure Dog now, could you? No, no, definitely not. They were um, the time and the place, the, the round the rounds, the, the, the referee, the fucking I don't know who the fucking referee is. <laughs> <laughs> so so your first fight out of pain, uh, who's in your corner for that? Who corner do? Um who did call me for? A guy called Michael Stelton. Mike um, Shelton? Yeah, yeah. Mike he was big on the scene when I first started training traditional jiu jitsu. He was, um, he, he was, he was up this neck of the woods doing a little bit with uh, what was the, the guy's name? Craig, Craig Bedes, um, Mark Burridge, a few of them, from, you know, local, local lad that's up with me. They, uh, they were doing a little bit of uh, training with Mike Shelton. He, he had a bit of a reputation of um, a tough old character to be training with Mike. Is, is, is that a fair yeah. reflection on him? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's a bit of a head, he was, right? Yeah, so so I heard, but so what was that? You know, what was the result of that first fight? I uh, lost unanimous decision. That loss was it. What? So, yeah. what what was your mindset and everything coming coming from that? Was it right? I'm, I'm going to take this serious. Was it? Oh, you know, it was a fight. I enjoyed it. But you know, did we have aspirations of becoming, you know, one one of the big names on the scene at that moment? Yeah, I walked straight back in the gym on a Monday. No, I didn't. I felt like. On the the following week, I went to jail. 
actually. <laughs> I asked what for. How long did you ask? On crutches. <laughs> <laughs> he he um, he done my crucial ligaments in. Yeah, and he got picked up by the old bill then on the Monday. So, so he goes into the jail the following week on, on crutches and he puts me on the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> and they give him a countdown. Right, guys, you've got to get into your cells. Ten, nine. <laughs> and I'm like, for fuck's sake, give me a break. <laughs> how, how long was you in prison for? Uh, three months I done. I had a year, uh, but I had uh, three months tag for good behaviour. Is that your first and only time where you had a scrape? You know, was that, have you been in, in trouble since that moment? Oh, yeah, God, a lot of trouble. Yeah. Always in, tra always in trouble, Shek. Always in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't keep myself out of trouble. What, 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 what was behind that, Mike? Just a, a bit of a tear away, a bit of an aggressive streak in you, do you think? I think um, I had a, a hard, hard upbringing. Um, certain things happened to me which uh, I haven't disclosed yet. Um, bullied all my life. Obviously, moving to Manchester, I was the only Welsh kid in the school. That must so have been tough. Yeah, so I was getting bullied then. Uh, my mother abandoned me at 11. Um, I, I got beaten up by a gang of boys when I was 15, and, and, and they didn't hurt me. And I looked at them and I said, you know what, you all just... You all just laid into me there. You didn't hurt me. I said, one by one, I'll have every one of them. And it was just from there. I just started training weights and, you know, just hitting the bag. And, and, and I just went on a tear up from there. So I, and, and I say this to people, you know, um, somebody, you know, somebody once said to me about, uh, you mustn't let your past experiences um, overcome you, but you've got to let it shape you. And I, what, what you've just said, I think, is true with a lot of people that I speak to that have, that have had difficult upbringings, it does mould you as a man, do you know what I mean? Uh, particularly when you've been victim of bullying and um, when you've had tough times and, you know, if you don't mind me touching on it, you know, like like no relationship with your, your mother then, yeah. it, it creates a mindset of with, you know, I've been through so much, a physical altercation isn't going to hurt me. Is that oh. fair to say? Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes as well, you're probably walking around, you don't mind, you know, and stop me if I'm wrong, Probably a little bit angry at the time as a young bloke as well, you know. Very angry, so very you angry. You probably overreact to certain situations a little bit, whereas now as an older bloke, you know, a bit more experience, you're aware of your capabilities as a fighter. Same as myself, I probably react a lot differently when I was in my 20s to now. Things go over my head and, you know, I'm a bit more relaxed and I don't let things wind me up and, and I don't think, take things so personally, you know. Well, yeah. is, is that fair with yourself as well with some of them experiences? Yeah, definitely, because, you know, in the valleys as well, it's a, there's a lot of partying and, uh, you know, I was getting drunk. And, uh, like you said, I was um, had bipolar schizophrenia, which I, I didn't know as of yet. And it was just any situation I could get into into trouble, I just... You know, I was, I was more it's than happy for this. Yeah, I'm going to touch on on some of the mental health issues in a, in a bit later on because I got some questions that have come in that I, I I'd like to run through with you on that, mate. Yeah. So you've had that fight. You've gone back into the gym. Um, how long was you training that traditional jujitsu? Because I, you know, I, I know for a fact that you've trained at some of the bigger gyms in the country. You know, Trojan Free Fighters when they were going through one of the biggest purple patches. Uh, London Shoot Fighters, you, you was down there when probably yeah. arguably at the time they were the most um, successful team in Europe, you know, be fair to say, would you agree? That's so, the best gym I've trained in. Uh, how, how, how did you end up training at these gyms and, you know, what what, what feedback would you give from your experiences there, Mike? Uh, I got invited up to Trojan Free Fighters by uh, Charlie Joseph, yeah, who, was, uh, running, who was running, running the show. And uh, <laughs> we done our first session, me, John, and uh, Rayburn. Yeah. Uh, the first session was Jiu-Jitsu. Hang on, just, just, just for people listening, he's talking about John Phillips and Phil Rayburn, both. Uh, John's obviously in the UFC and Phil's an accomplished MMA fighter. Go on, Mike, sorry. Right, so uh, we're doing a Jiu-Jitsu and everyone's paired up and uh, Ronnie Mann is left, right? So it's, so it's me and Ronnie Mann, right? Yeah. So Ronnie Mann sitting on the mats. And I'm standing by Charlie, and he says, go on, pair up, with, pair up with Ronnie. And I'm looking at Ronnie, and I said, I can't pair up with him, you better. And he said, why not? He said, he's, he's all right. I said, he's, look at him, he's tiny. <laughs> I, I was like, you know, massive, yeah, yeah. Weight there, 110 kilos, Ronnie's yeah. like 65. Yeah. Oh, he's all right, he's all right. I was like, no, I can't, I can't pair up with him. He just, honestly, he said, he's all right. So I goes over, I'm like taking my time, flips me over, stabs me straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I 
is. So uh, it goes a little bit harder, flips me over, stabs me straight away. And I get a little bit harder, and I'm going full blown. I starts on top, full blown, flips me over, stabs me straight away. I was like, fucking hell. This is what I need to learn. That, that, that was my inspiration, that Ronnie that, Man. That was your introduction to jiu-jitsu, yeah? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was my introduction to BJJ. It, it's, um, I say this to people that don't train. It's a really humbling experience that first time, right? And uh, I had Joe Duffy on the last podcast, and I was I was uh, speaking about past experiences with him. I remember going to his gym for the first time with no grappling experience, and he's a 14-year-old skinny kid, you know, I'm twice the size of him. And exactly as you said, I've gone in a little bit like thinking, oh, boom, he's submitting me to a triangle. Then I've gone a, a, about 70%, boom, tap me with a triangle. Then I've gone 100 mile an hour and he's gone triangle, triangle. Tri-. He's done me about five times in like a five minute round. And, and those experiences, they either make you or break you as a fighter. You can go from it, go back to your comfort zone, go back to the, the original clubs you're training at and think, I'm not going back there. Or probably as, as was the case with you, when it was the case with me, you've gone, I need to learn this shit. This is something that I've got to... I've got to get involved with. Is that that's, fair to say? That's exactly what my mindset was. I need to learn this shit. Yeah. I thought I was the man. I was beating up all these big names in the valleys. Yeah, on the yeah. streets fighting. And I, you know, I thought I was an odd man. And then he just flipped me over, done me like seven, eight times in five minutes. So, <laughs> how long was you up a Trojan for, mate? Um, I spent a few years at Trojan. Um, then uh, I got introduced to... In, in while training with Trojan, uh, Braulio and Roger. Yeah, yeah. So Braulio Estima, Roger Gracie. Yeah. Uh, again, same thing. Not um, much knowledge on BJJ on the BJJ scene. I didn't know who Braulio and uh, Roger was. So uh, goes up training. We do an MMA, MMA grappling. You know, ground and pound grappling. So I'm going with Braulio, and um, I, I did all right. Sub me a couple of times. Nothing like like Ronnie did. So it, it wasn't such a um, you know, like a mind blowing experience, yeah, yeah. But then, and obviously, I've done the same with Roger. Next day, I goes up, Charlie takes me up with uh, Braulio. It's me and Braulio on, on, on our own, yeah. and he says, uh, Hey, dude, no gloves today, just just a grapple, yeah. So I'm like, Oh, yeah, whatever. And I must have got sub 30 times in five minutes, yeah. And then I was like, Who the fuck is this? Guy? <laughs> yeah, I've um. Uh, I've been blessed to have, <laughs> have the experience of grappling with Braulio. And I say to everybody, you, you feel like a three-year-old child. Um, it, when people talk, it, it's hard to believe that there's such a difference in level with people grappling, isn't it, Mike? Oh, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. He had me, right, Rich? No word will lie. On top, inside control. Full grip. Holding, up, pinning him down. And then say, count to three and tell him I'm ready, yeah? One, two, three, ready. Out within 10 seconds, sub. I was like, what the, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> I remember um, a few years ago, I was in his guard, and I, I've gone, Christ, I think I've, I've passed off guard. And I don't know what I was thinking. I should have known he's right. Next thing you know, Mike, I've gone up in the air, he's helicopter arm barred me. Yes, helicopter arm barred me. The maddest submission he ever caught me with, he was in sight control on me, and he had his arms like gable gripped around me. Yeah. And I swear to you, I've been, I, I've rolled with some big, heavy, strong physical... Shoulder pressure in the but, neck. No, he just squeezed through my, like, through, like, my ribs. And I've took this big gasp of air and I've breathed out. And then I've gone to breathe again and I can't Shoulder breathe. Shoulder pressure in the neck. Unbelievable, bud. Unbelievable pressure. It absolutely... Gr- I say to everybody that the, he feels 25 stone, doesn't he, when he's on top of it? Yeah, he was stabbing me from side control, just like pushing his shoulder in the neck. Mental, innit? Mental. Yeah. Mental. So, you train with like those guys? Like um, basically, things started falling apart in Trojan. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was no guys to train with. Um, I was put into a Bama tournament um, with Jamie Earn, um, Jimmy Manua, and... Luke, some Luke guy, I can't remember. But anyway, the, the, it ended up falling through the tournament, did. But there was, there was nobody to train with. Zelg and uh, James Thompson had gone to London shoot. Yeah. And, and Zelg said that I should come down and, you know, give it a go, at, you know, come and have a go at training in London shoot. So that's when I went down there then and started training in London shoot fighters. How long was you down there for, Mike? Uh, I was in shoot fighters two years. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what was that experience like? Yeah, brilliant. Ah, oh, phenomenal, Jim. 
Yeah. Come on, what are you had um, Zella Glessig, James Thompson, James Sikic, John Athoe, um, it was just Marius Romskis. Yeah. It was just a who's who of um, talent in there, like. They, I, I mean, they're one of the gyms that stood the test of time. They provided, over the years, UFC uh, level guys and they're still putting guys in there now, even to this day and age. Do you know what I mean? So, um, who was the coaches down here at the time, Mike? Losing your sex, and you are you still there? Uh, yeah. yeah, you're back you now. Who's the who's the coaches down there, Mike, at the uh, time? Uh, uh, Paul, uh, I don't know the second name. Paul and Alexis. Yeah. They, they mean, and um, at the time there was about seven to eight uh, BGJ black belts on the mat, and yeah. at the time you were Chris Reese was a purple belt. Yeah, yeah. So down there for some years. Um, what you know? What happened? Because you had a little bit of a hiatus then from MMA, didn't you? You know, you, you you didn't fight for a while. What what was the reasons behind that? Was it personal reasons or just fell out of love with the sport a little bit? Basically, I got um, I won the the eight man ultimate challenge to, uh, eight man tournament. Yeah, and got matched with Jimmy Manuel then for the the main title. Yeah. But I come home and I was it was I was someone like three grand in debt. Um, me and a missus was going to Morrison's. We were paying a pound for um, roast potatoes, spreading them out a day, a little bit of gravy on each meal, borrowing five hours for electric, and I, I couldn't even travel. I couldn't even afford a ticket yeah. to get to London to travel, uh, to to train, and it, it it just it just put me on a downward spiral from air shit, To be honest. Yeah. So. Lost a bit of love with MMA, but you, you, you still continue to grapple now, yeah? Is that when you joined her and started doing a bit of training with, with Chris and John a bit more on a regular basis? Um, What did I do from there? Yeah, I just, I, I just carried on training and then, uh, I was just trying to hit all the, the different martial arts. Um, because at the time, my size, I couldn't find anybody my level. I, I, and I think that's a case, John, for, for anyone that's like heavyweight, heavyweight at the moment. Any any boys like who, who are big physical lumps, they tend to be dragged towards the rugby scene a bit more, don't they? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, I say this to everyone, particularly, you know, I think right throughout the UK, the, the, the strength in depth is there, the like the weight's probably right up until middleweight, but then I think it thins out a bit from like heavyweight on, because then big, bigger, you know, lads like yourself who, who are natural athletic physical attributes can make a living these days in rugby. You know, even if yeah. you're a great, great player, you can go and get your, your few hundred quid a week for, for playing rugby uh, work you know, alongside your work, isn't it? And I think that draws some of the bigger lads away, which does make it difficult for you then, doesn't yeah. it? So In in Wales, you, you find lower lower weights. You, you got it great. Like, you walk into Chris Reed's Academy, and there'll be 40 of them rolling around. Yeah. And, and, and I'll be sitting there. I, I, won't even get, I won't even get a roll because nobody wants a roll. They're like, oh, he's too big, he's too strong, or he's, they're afraid of me. And it's like, and even if I do get a roll, I've got a roll light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's, there's a couple of big boys coming on the scene now, you know, which I could train with. Like, you know, you've got Ash Amos and Jack, you've got John, you've got Shane Price. You know, yeah. you've got a few few big boys that you know you could you could you know match up with like. That's probably yeah. something you boys ought to have a look at, you know, because it is so thin. I think probably in Wales it'd be an idea for you boys grappling wise to, to get together and um have a session, even if it's only once a month, isn't it? You know, it gives you an opportunity of, of trying stuff out against boys the same dap and that then as well. Yeah, that's why I, I I try to study so many like martial arts. I I try to compete every weekend. Yeah. In the different martial arts, like the judo, the BJJ, the, the nogi, and stuff like that, and the wrestling, just to try and get that mirror quality image sparring. Yeah, I know you're saying. Someone yeah. new size, someone new level, and just just continuously do that every weekend, just to get yeah. the experience. Like, there's um, there's a great photograph I've seen of you at the judo comp with uh, you fought some some guy that must have been about 10, 15 stone heavier than you. Where was that to, Mike? Um, he was actually uh, you on about the, the big giant. Yeah, big huge fella. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was in uh, Wales Open, in the Welsh Open. I was Welsh Open. Was it? Is he yeah. a Welsh guy? No, he's. Uh, no. I don't know where he's from, but he was seven foot two, two hundred six kilos. Jesus, and, and you you matched up with him? Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Uh, pushing him round, 
swept them a couple of times. Yeah. So you, you got the win. You got the win against the big fella there. No, oh, they they disqualified me. Really, you know, so. <laughs> For what? A pathetic, a pathetic quali- disqualification <laughs> as well. I was up three one. Yeah. And we was at the edge of the match. I went to push him off the edge of the match, and because I touched just below his belt, they disqualify oh. you because you can't let him grab. Never. Yeah. They, they keep chopping and changing the rules in judo, and I, th- I think they'll end up killing the sport, if I'm honest. I mean, I'd love to go back to the leg grabs and double legs and, and, and you know, mix it up. I think it makes it a much more well-rounded sport, you know, and I, I don't know. I don't know if they've done it for political reasons to keep maybe the, the Japanese at the top of the tree because the Russians were coming through with some really good judokas, probably some American wrestlers cross-training over it to it, you know. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, definitely, yeah. Right, a couple of, couple of questions on your, your fight career. Which win gives you the most satisfaction? Which which win in your MMA career has given you the most satisfaction? Um, I'd say Jamie Earn. Yeah? Yeah. What, what's the reason? Why, why was that one that stands out for you? They didn't like Jamie the dickhead. Yeah, where's he from? Uh, he's from Slough. He's... um. He's actually um, quite famous, well, not famous, but well known for being on, uh, what's that uh, daytime TV fucking thing? Uh, you know, with all the editors go on. Oh, no good asking me, but. The daytime TV, you know TV. Jeremy Kyle. Jeremy Kyle. He's ah, right, Jeremy yeah. Kyle show. Yeah, yeah. All about how many women he shagged behind his missus in his back and that. Oh, great. And Just... he's like, uh. Ask him, why, ask him why, and he's like, what why? He said, uh, it's because of the wang. They call me the wang. Oh, you're joking. Proper news, oh, then. <laughs> yeah, when he, when he, he got, when he come out to fight me, he got carried out in the coffin. <laughs> and then, before he goes into the cage, he's kissing all the ring girls. Oh. I'm standing in there waiting for him to come out. And, and, he, and people like that are more, more concerned about being famous than a fighter, probably, but... Exactly, yeah. You're right. Right. Probably. So that's the one that's given you more satisfaction. What was your toughest fight? Someone, and it, it can be a win, it can be a loss, but you've, you know, when that final bell is gone, you've, you've had a bit of respect for that opponent and thought, you know what, that was a job well done. That was a tough old fight. John and Tosca. Yeah, where did you fight him to? Fought him in Dubrovnik in, in Croatia. In Croatia, he was yeah. a Slovakian guy. Yeah, what was the result on that? Uh, I lost on a decision. Yeah, t- t- tough guy. Did he continue? Have you seen him since on the circuit at all, Mike? He, um, he had a couple of fights after me. He, he was, uh, do you know, Michael Matula? Mm. Polish guy in KSW. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's seen him with a few, a few of them guys throwing them around like afterwards, but uh, he didn't continue. He could have been a good guy. Good fella. Basically, like I, I must have kicked a threw 40 leg kicks and he blocked every single one. Check, check, check. Yeah, oh, check there. Like, yeah. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> John would shout, hey, Mike, you're going to do something else now? And I'm like, I fucking can't do something. <laughs> right, so he is who you would regard as your toughest a fight. Um, who would be your dream opponent? If you could pick somebody to fight, who, who, who would that be? And it could be past or present. Um... I would have liked to have my fight with Jimmy Manoa. Yeah, that that would have been a good matchup for you, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, because he's gone on to do great things as well, Jim, isn't he? Yeah. He's probably been one of the I, most successful guys, you know, from the UK to ever go into the UFC. So that yeah. that would have. It was just just there. I was just just there. Well, what happened? Why did that never come to fruition? Then why didn't that happen? I come home and I was in debt, and I. Oh, so that was it. Then you did, yeah, yeah, and 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 that that that's went, went from there. Right. Um. Obviously, uh, when, when you're, you're, your more famous trainer partners is John, you, you know, you've got a great relationship, obviously, in the gym and out of the gym with John. What's it like training with him and um, what type of character is he, you know, to, to be around on a day-to-day basis? Oh, John's, um, John's an Ed. Uh, he's, he's, he's always up, always up for a laugh. And uh, <laughs> you, can ne- you can never drop your guard around John. <laughs> I can never. Because he'll suck I- you up with something. I had a couple of days with him in a man Jordan, and um, he's constant, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? He's, he's constant. Oh, he's constant. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I like John, good character, but, uh, you know, training must be lovely for you to see that, you know, he finally made his dream come true and got in the UFC as well, and for you to be part of that. Yeah, definitely. is uh, what he deserves, isn't he? He's, um, you know, it was like, um, he, he'd had something like 
20, 21st round knockouts and an extensive amateur boxing background as well. And to still not be called up when... Well, I, I, I had this. I had this conversation with um, uh, with Duffy and Jenkins. I think in Wales, probably John and John and Marshman, you know, they should have been called up way before because their oh. records and they, you know, the, the the way they were winning fight. And I th- I think probably at the time it was just that Wales was a little bit unfashionable, you know, on the MMA scene. And I think if they'd been at one of the big clubs, you know, training in London or or, or Manchester or, or even Ireland at the time, they'd have probably been called up a bit sooner. Is, you think that's fair to say? Definitely, both of them, John and Marshman, fought a who's who, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. They, so they, I... they fought, they fought everyone, and Marshman yeah. was knocking everyone out. John was knocking everyone out, and I seen John twenty first round knockout, still not called up. And then I watch a UFC show, and there's a girl on it, two and one. Yeah, yeah, and and, and same, same with the men, but you know, I was looking at guys on there that were seven and oh, eight and oh, but because they were at the right gyms and were a little bit more fashionable than our lads, and I was getting a bit despondent, you know. So when the call finally did come. You know, it, it, was, it was great, not just for us as a team, but Welsh MMA, and it did open the door. I mean, like, we, we got four lads in there now, um, and, and, and all holding their own. I think it's brilliant, you know. So, what, what what's your thoughts at the moment on the current state of Welsh MMA? What's your, what's your thoughts on where we're at it at present? You know, not just the UFC, even at grassroots level. I think, um, I, I don't pay too much attention to it, but what I do see, I think, you know, it's, it's coming along well, like, coming along strong. Your team... that they show and you know there's, there's a lot of you know people stick with it don't they yeah I look- whereas i see other gyms they grow fighters and the fighters move on you know? yeah I, I, I think i think we're a little bit lucky these days mike that like back in your day of my day you know we had to, as you said you've had to travel to trojan had to travel to, to london to get that that top tier uh, coaching Whereas I think the, the youngsters don't appreciate how, how lucky they are these days that, you know, they don't have to drive far, do they? You know, they've got a black belts in jiu-jitsu, good level wrestlers, they've got Thai boxers of a really good calibre. The, the the level of coaching available to these young fighters now is something we, we only dreamed of when we were young young blokes, that's fair to say as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. 100%. I, I come across a kid who went to come and train with me. He was from Bajend. I was teaching him battle, but and he said I'd love to come and train with you. I said, "Well, you know, pop down, no, you know, no dramas. Come and train. You know, you're more than welcome." And he was like, "Yeah, but you know, I'd have to take the train from the gender battle, but I'm like, that's stopping it. Like, yeah, I, mean, I was up and down the country every week to Trojan, every week to London to get the training, and you can't go one train stop." It's the same as anything in life, but it, you know, if you want something bad enough, you you make them sacrifices together. You know, it's, if it was easy, but they, they, you know, everybody be doing it. So yeah. you know, I, I'm the same. Pe- people have people come and train with me, and and they've really got to show a, a will and a commitment if if they want 100 percent off the coaching team. Do you know what I mean? Because I yeah. I don't really want to be wasting time on somebody who's going to waste my time. You know? No, exactly. Um, do you think you do you think you'll compete? I've seen recently that you you spoke on on um, social media about possibly fighting again. Is that something you're serious about? Yeah, I was. Yeah, definitely serious about it. I was um, really motivated to you know give it a go, get back training and stuff. Um, what my problem was when I lost my last fight, uh, I got really down and depressed about it. Um, hit me hard, mainly because. I made the stupid mistake myself and didn't, no one you just don't get going. Yeah, yeah. No one then fights you, you know, you just didn't get, you just didn't do nothing. I, 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 was, I was there for that fight and, and you know, I've seen you fight plenty of times and, and I, I agree, you, you you just didn't seem to get into your rhythm on that fight, did you? And it's yeah. not the Mike Edwards that we, we you know, we, we know you're capable of being. Yeah, and I know that feeling just ate to me and ate to me and ate to me and then I, um, obviously we'll speak later on about the mental health stuff, but, I went spiraling downhill on the mental health and I got put on tablets. Yeah. Uh, lithium. And it basically is, I can't get dehydrated on these tablets, otherwise I'll go into a coma. I got you. I got you. So, so it affects your weight cutting and everything then as well. Yeah. yeah. So the guy was saying, why ever do this? Yeah. Or, you know, you want to fight and, you know, it's your mental health or, or the fight. Do you know what I mean? That's where you've got to make them priorities. Yeah? You know what I mean? Well, you know, you've got to, like you said, uh, uh, have you got? Have you got? Have you got um, kids, Mike? Yeah, I got three kids. Three kids, you know, and, and th- these impact then on your decision making, don't they? Around these things, exactly, you know, it's not just yeah. yourself. You've got to think about, you know. Exactly. 
I want to touch on your grappling because like everyone I've ever spoken to has always said to me, you're an elite level grappler. Anybody that's, that's trained with you, they, 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 you know, the feedback I've ever had is how good you are. And I remember, I remember competing at um, the British Open when, when you won the Black Belt division. I, I won um, my division on the same, the same year. Yeah. Uh, um, you won, remember, but me, me and our Jack, our Jack was a juvenile, he won the juvenile British Championship on the same day. Um, but you were purple belt then, and, you know, I think that probably just showed the level you're at. To win the British Open at black belt is is, is no joke, you know, I know I've been competing in it for years. So, obviously, uh, are you still purple belt, Mike, or are you a higher belt now? A brown belt four tag now. Brown belt four tag, yeah. Are you still training in the gi with anybody at the moment? Uh, you know. I haven't done anything for the last two years since since I've been put on. That's really. So, who, who's you still doing your BJJ? We're still with Chris. Still with Chris, yeah. Yeah. So, you, like I said, you know, that, that black belt will come. So, you know, is it something? You, is it something you're aspiring to, or you, you, you know, you're not concerned? It'll happen when it happens. Nah, I'm not bothered. It'll, it'll happen. It happens. Yeah, and, I'm, and I say this to everybody, you don't you don't really, do you need a belt, you know, do you need that colour belt around your waist to tell you how good you are, you know, because I see it now, I got I got lads in my gym that are, that are blue belts, who, particularly in the nogi side of things, are giving black belts a torrid time, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and I say to them, it's a process, it, you know, it, it, it'll come when it comes, you know. Um, are you still, are you still coaching at the moment? No, i stop stopped coaching now. Because again, like um, online um, t today, Kevin Reed made a, a comment saying that he felt he was one of the best coaches he'd been under. And again, that's something that gets fed back to me on a regular basis from guys that I meet on the circuit that have trained under you, say about how good you are as a coach. So is it reasons why you've, you, you're not coaching at the moment? Just uh, a lack of time, too much time with the family or you get frustrated? Yeah, it's just my mental health. Uh, shake it doesn't I don't do well with um, being around people yeah so I can one day I could be around you great and then three four days in I need just need to be in my room like yeah yeah uh, yeah uh, and I suppose it, that that's going to be a huge hindrance for you if coaching is anyone going to because I know full on you know from the job I do it's a 24 hour job seven days a week you know you've got to be there for them yeah. you know, you've got to be there for them all. I can't say you know I can't train this kid for a week and then not train him for two weeks and I mean, you've got to you've got to put your your heart and soul into them, haven't you? Yeah, and and to, and to be fair, you know that's quite selfless of you then to say, well, look, I can't commit to it, and honest of you, you know, and not doing anybody a disservice in that way. When you have done your coaching, who's the best fighter you've ever coached? Who would you say is the most talented person you've coached? Um, I'd say this was a fool, really. <laughs> Go on, uh, get, get uh, through a couple at me. Lou Long. Yeah, really talented boy, Lou. I've got a lot of time for Lou. Yeah, John Phillips, obviously. Obviously. Um, Josh Ellis is a very talented kid. Yeah, jo Josh is one, I think, um, has not fulfilled his potential. You know, he went on, he won the Worlds at the IMAFs. Um, yeah. And I think he got knocked back. He, he picked up a loss, didn't he, on one of my shows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know whether that knocked his confidence, but I, I remember th at the time when he won the IMAFs, I, I, for one, you know, I wasn't coaching him anything, but I thought, well, this kid's going to have a big future in the sport, and he just seemed to drift off off it then, didn't he? Uh, big O's, you know, big O's, Owen Gwynn? Yeah, Owen, uh, big, big, big savage grappler. I remember yeah. he was doing it, he was doing the same as you, mind, back in the day. I remember him grappling some higher level belts uh, in Nogi. I think he's black belt judo, isn't he? And I remember yeah. him, uh, I remember he was training with Chris Reese, and he unleashed him at a white belt. And he fought some big lads that were like purples and browns and some nogi and he, oh, he just smashing them. But he was a big, <laughs> big, big savage of a man like yourself. Uh, yeah, he's one of my main uh, training partners. Always, he's a he's a monster. Like, is he still training now, mate? Yeah, he's down at Chris Reese's. Yeah, yeah. Who who have you trained with? Um, there's probably been, and I don't like to say the term waste of talent, but has unfulfilled their potential. There, somebody who, who who had the talent to have gone all the way. Um, if they just put a little bit more effort and a bit more time on the, you know, time into their training. Um. 
I'd say one one person, if he would compete, is wasting say wasting his talent. Yeah, is a, a guy called Vincent McCracken. McCracken. Yeah. Um, is he from your neck of the woods? From the gend. Yeah. And his grappling, right? Is, I go out and say it is the best in Wales. Yeah, and doesn't compete at all, does he? You'll only, you'll only find him in his garage. Never. So. I, I trained with him once and I grappled with him and I beat him and then he asked me to teach him and I taught him in for a couple of years and then I couldn't get anywhere near him. And what's his name again? Vincent, Vincent McCracken. McCracken. That's when I'll, 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 I'll put that on the back. Literally, you start grappling with him, you grab a guillotine and you think you like fish fucking flashing before you. <laughs> Those just unbelievably strong. Keep your, keep and your you, won't, you, won't, you won't find him in no gyms. No. Just That's in his garage. And I, I think there's loads of those around the uh, around the world, isn't it? No intentions of of making yeah. it like a priority, but have got that natural talent, which which is mental. Because t- is he a bigger lad? No, he's thirteen stone. Oh yeah, so you know, it's pretty, t- and and in the current climate, see, Mike, the potential around the MMA. I say this, it wasn't around so much when when you was competing at your peak, but there's an opportunity now to earn good money. You know, yeah. like some Brett. Jack Marshman, Jack Shaw, John, all getting in the UFC have opened the doors up. Lou fighting in Bellator. There's op- opportunities now of making a good living out of it, you know. So it's frustrating when you see these boys. They've got all this talent, yet um, I haven't got that, that that will to go and do it for a living, really, isn't it? Paul Jenkins asked on um, online earlier, what was your, you know, because you've spoken about you, you've, you've had issues with mental health. What was your frame of mind 15 minutes before you went into a fight? Uh, what, what what was your mindset like at that point? Well, I, I I personally don't care, right? I my mindset was everybody gets held up on the crowd and they think they nervous, but my mindset was I learned to to trigger it as you're not nervous, you're just feeling adrenaline in your body. Yeah. So your mind is perceiving yourself to be going out to a fight, so it's creating adrenaline, so you don't feel pain. So what I'm actually think feeling now, this adrenaline is going to help me in there because I'm not going to feel no fucking pain. Yeah, I, I feel it in the morning, but I'm not going to feel it now. Yeah. So I'm going to enjoy this drugs. You know I mean, it's a free drug, so I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I say to everybody that the best drug in the world is that adrenaline after a fight, yeah. isn't it? Whether you win or lose, as long as you've given a good account. I used to come from a fight and I'd be like, do you know why? I, I'm on top of the world. And, and for somebody like yourself who suffers with mental health, that must be... That feeling of elation must have been brilliant, and he wanted to hang on to that in hours and hours. Yeah, and then the fear, you know, the fear of the crowd. I used to turn it around and say, "These are you to see, you know, see me shine, see yeah. me shine for the for the, the solid training I put in." So yeah. I just adapted that mindset, and too many times I was too calm. Yeah. So I have to be, you know, when they call my name and my music comes on, I've got to have that music, and I'll be, I got to be like, "Fuck, here we go." Yeah, yeah. Get it going, end. I mean, not yeah, to be yeah. too calm. And I think that's that's a, a skill set in its own is having the right mindset, knowing when to switch it on, not switching on too soon, so it sucks the life out of you because you've been yeah. hanging around for an hour, feeling feeling the nerves and everything else. And I, I remember watching um, the Ultimate Fighter when Chael Sonnen was uh, uh, was was one of the coaches. I don't know if you've seen any, and and he made a statement to the team, and he lived with me forever. And he said, um, "You see people in the gym, and they're absolute savages, yet they yeah. can't do it when you've got a crowd." Now he says. Nothing has changed apart from the environment. And he said what he'd done at one of his gyms, he put a, a length of 4 by 2 out on the on the floor. And he said to all his fighters, right, walk across that, fo- balance on it. And every one of them went from one end to the other. Yeah. Then he picked it up and put it on top of step ladders. And he said, walk across it now. And all was going, hey, again up there. And he's gone, you've all just done it. It's the, 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 the actual act is still the same, but the environment has changed. And that's the same with fighting. If you can take... Your mindset from that training, when you're training in the in the cage in the in the gym in front of just 15, 20 people, into an environment in front of twelve thousand people, there's nothing different apart from that environment and the weight of expectation and, and the nerves of thinking you know you're letting people down. So the mental side of it, I think, in today, particularly at the top level, I mean, the, the, the likes of your mate John, you know, he's got a real mental strength of knees. He's not phased, and I, I I don't think you can coach that into a fighter. They've they've either got it or they've learned it over over years of experience. That's believe it or not, even though I got um, what you call mental health issues, yeah. my strongest asset is my mindset. I mean, yeah, I, I train my kids there, just mindset. And, and that's probably like, going, going back to your experiences as a youngster, as you said, you know, broken home and, and, and tough times. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's like um, Billy Priest said to me, right? He said, when you fight a guy, right, there's two situations you're going to have, right? He can kick you in the balls, right? And the man can fall to the floor and hold his balls in pain, or he can stand and fight. You're in the same pain on the floor holding your balls as you are standing there and yeah. fighting. Yeah, that's a good show. And he was teaching me as a 10-year-old kid. Yeah. And it's something for you... <clears throat> And, and uh, you've carried that through with you, like. Um, yeah. Couple of questions off online. Um, Ricky Wright has asked, "What did you think of Pride? Did you go out there cornering? Was it cornering? You went out to Pride, or has he got that wrong?" Lost your head, Shake. Sorry, Mike. I said Ricky Lost Wright asked. Ricky Wright asked, "What what was your thoughts of Pride when you experienced it? Did you go out to Pride?" Uh -huh. Pride was amazing. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Pride was just um, just not you know it was something like I don't know fucking fifty sixty thousand seats and the way they they present the fighters in, in the beginning. I know that yeah. the, the pride theme going and they they hit in the drums. Yeah, ah, oh, it's fucking so, so, so you fought out there, Mike, or, or... no, I no, you caught it, corner. Corner Zelg and James. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, I remember those guys out there, yeah, yeah. But uh, br brilliant, yeah. I miss the Pride Days as well, you know. Um, I think the Japanese have an understanding of the sport that's unique to anybody else in the world. They appreciate it because they brought up with it. Oh, they're unbelievable, unbelievable fans. Right, your buddy John Phillips have asked me to ask you about the Kevin Randleman story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, basically, me and John are sitting in the foray, right? And yeah. there's this big woman there. She's taller than me, big set woman. And we're looking over, we think, we're saying to each other, fuck, she's big and she's looking and blah, blah, blah. And she's she's caught this, isn't it? And as she's caught this, and Randleman's come up. And he's come up, like, then kissed her. It's his, it's his fucking wife, right? So she must have said to him, you know, she's looked at us, pointed, and he's come over. So him and Manure have come over. And, uh, he shakes John's hand, and John's thinking, fucking hell, what's he going to do, Bjorn? We just, you know, do you think we're taking a piss out of his wife, like? <laughs> and uh, he shakes John's hand, and he shakes my hand, and he says, oh, you've got big hands, are you? And I says, not as big as hers. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go down? Yeah, but it would, uh, they took us out clubbing and everything afterwards. They were brilliant, they were. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, <laughs> a, a question off my lad, Jack Shaw. He's asked... What's the best story you've got about John Phillips? Or oh, you're not allowed to say? Uh, too many. Too many, I can't say. Too many to go into. I, and funny enough, John, I think John commented on his comment. If he starts that, he'll be all night talking to the old man. It'll, so. be, a long, it'll be a long, long story. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to touch in, you know, because you're happy for me to have a chat about, about, about the mental health issues. Um so, you know, you touched on earlier as a kid, you felt suicidal. So you've always known that you, you've suffered. Is it depression and bipolar you said you suffer with? Bipolar, uh, schizophrenia. Okay, so how often does it impact on you? Is it a daily battle, Mike, or does it come and go in phases? I have, uh, well, I have, I have rapid cycling bipolar. So I can be happy with you like this now. Yeah. And then three hours time, man, I, won't, I can't be near you. Yeah, you 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 make me you irritate me. Yeah, make me feel nasty and aggressive. Yeah, and then I'll get voices in my head, and it, it just it, it's just up and down daily, and then I can it it times then where I can be down for two weeks, uh, up for a couple of days, suicidal oh. you, and then happy you, and then I can for a couple of days I'm gonna be like right, I'm gonna be the champion of the world. I'm gonna go to Bellator, I'm gonna be champion. I'll, I'll rinse them all. And then three days later, then I want to commit suicide. I don't need anywhere near that. Yeah. I mean, so, like it's... so, so you said you're on this medication for it, which which is impact on you doing like a weight cutting and stuff like that. Is that a daily? Is that a daily tablet, or do you take it when when you're on a downer? You know, how, how does it work? I'm on seven different medications. Yeah. Uh, and I'm on them morning and nightly every day. If I if I miss them. Yeah. I, my. Um, I get worse, like, I mean. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask. So, you know, a personal question. If you weren't to have the medication, 
you know, does it put you in such a dark place where you're thinking about ending your life or ending someone else's life? Does it does it take you to that moment? I'd either kill someone or I'd kill myself. Yeah, yeah. So thankfully for you a benefit and others, you know, there's medication out there that, that doesn't cure it but just keeps you keeps people, you bubbling. But people with the same medication, you know, it's done work and it's for the, the big pharmacies to make money and that I tell you, they save mine and my family's life. Well, I, I, I've I've seen it, Mike, you know. <clears throat> I, I know people in my family and friends that um that are on medication for men, for mental health purposes. And I can see the difference. I know when they've not taken these tablets. You know, I can tell. I can tell as soon as I've had the first conversation within a minute. You know, so I agree with you. I, you know, they're there for a purpose. And and if it's keeping, like you said, you and your family safe, I, I'm all for it. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Do you do you do you speak to people, John? Uh, Mike, you know, do you have conversation? Have you got a psychologist you go to, or a doctor, or a counselor that you speak to on a regular basis? Yeah, I got a psychiatrist that I, I got to see every six weeks. Yeah, uh, got a good uh, it, is it the same one that you've built up a same relationship? One, yeah, yeah. So, this one is is brilliant, like unbelievable, um, like a pa pa Pakistani, but uh, phenomenal, phenomenal good relationship. And I think that helps. So you can probably go in there and open up a little bit and be honest. Yeah, he's the only one who understood me because the other ones before it, they'd be like time watching and not listening to what I'm saying and saying. The reasons I'm like this is because I had a joint fucking six years ago, and uh. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, what I got about you a few is you know because there's a, it's a taboo subject, mental health, isn't it? You know, it's, it's getting yeah. a bit better now. People like yourself, and and there's more and more famous people um, bringing it up and, and and giving it the exposure it deserves. Because for too too long, I think it was a hidden illness where people, you know, particularly as men, men wouldn't discuss it, would they? You know, and oh. wouldn't be willing to admit when there was problems. So, what advice would you give to anyone that's got concerns that they, you know, they are suffering with mental health? What advice is somebody who's been through it since eleven year old kid would, would would you give to that person? And how can they how can they seek help? I'd say first of all, if you've got a partner. You know, if you're with your partner, try and um, speak about it with your partner, and hopefully they, you know, get them to understand. Um, seek a doctor. Uh, if you you can't think of the thing like you need to say, I'd say what I did is I wrote them all down, all the problems um, they could read it. Yeah. A lot of times when you get into the doctors and you're talking like this, you can't. You know, like we are now, you think, oh, fuck, I should have asked, asked him that. Yeah, yeah, of course. I should have said that afterwards when you're gone. But if, so, so, so if you all down. write it all down and you take a week, yeah, if you take a week to just jot all the feelings that you got down, you know, take it in, show it in the dirt, and that's what I did, and that's what I got moved then to be, you know, when they take a look at you, like, yeah, is there, is there any any websites, any any charities you could recommend for people to seek out as well, Mike? There's a a thing in uh, in Wales and South Wales called called Mind that that you could uh, get get in touch with. If you if you will after if you drop me a text with the details for that, I'll put that on the final slide after after we finish filming. But all right, just for people to touch touch base with. Right, Th thanks for your op being open and honest about that, Mike. And I think, you know, hopefully th there's not just fighters, there's people that are watching this that will um, we'll, we'll seek out if they feel they need it. If they see somebody like you, this, you know, a big physical, what I call an alpha male type of bloke, and you're willing to, to address it in public, I think that's brilliant, mate. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it'll give people the confidence to pick up that phone or... or seek that's, out the reason I, that's the reason I do a shake, right? Because yeah. I know people, people in their minds... People, a lot of people are struggling, but a lot of people don't want to show it, right? Because as a man, you, you're taught as a kid to get up, don't cry, brush it off, you're fine. Yeah. Right? You're not taught to, taught to express your feelings. Yeah. But if people look at me, tough, tough big guy fight that people have got a lot of respect for, I tell you now, when I'm in a bad state of mind, I can get in a car, turn a song on, and the first couple of tunes will make me cry. I'll start yeah. crying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If I can show that it, it happens to me, then you all can, you know, just just be honest and, and find out for yourself. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I work in a school in the days and um, my, my role is behaviour manager. If you can imagine, I deal with a lot of, lot of youngsters between the age of 11 and 16, really vulnerable kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, I see it on a daily basis. Some of these kids 
displaying real real issues of mental health. And what I will say now in the school system, it's not a perfect world, but they, they are addressing it at a, at a very young age, which probably wasn't around when he was 11 years of age. You know, oh, we got enough. we got um, doctors in school and nurses in school now will refer them to, to CAMS and ed psychs right from the off if we you know suspect that there's there's underlying issues. So the the, the more exposure mental health cares, I'm an advocate of it, and um, thank you for being honest and touching on that, mate. All right, we'll uh, we'll finish off with a couple more MMA questions. I'll let you enjoy your evening then, Mike. So, um, right. Who is your favourite fighter of all time, and the reasons behind that? Fedor Emelianenko. Yeah. And because he's just he's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and not your stereotypical fighter to look at, is he? You know, I say this to the youngsters now. You know, because the, the the newbies are joining in the gym. They didn't think there was MMA before Conor McGregor, and uh, and I say to them, you know, I give them. I give him um, Nagera's fight against Bob Sapp to go back and look at the pride. Yeah, yeah. I, I say, go and watch Fedo against some of these monsters, against Nagera, against Crocop, back in his... And, you know, Fedo would be one of these people, I think you'd agree, that would walk in a room and he wouldn't give him a second look and think, oh, there's, uh, there's the baddest uh, man yeah. in the world, you know? But what a fighter, what what a skill set. And and I used to love how he carried himself as well, you know? I, I, I think that was key. Today's day and age... There's too many people trying to be trying to be brash and be the next Conor McGregor. Where he was all about the art, wasn't he? You know, he turned all about up, the art. All he, about didn't the ha- he didn't have to speak. His Respect. actions spoke louder than words. And Best he, he, one was um, who's the the big text and he fought with him a walk. Oh, um, I know you're on about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, when they they come into the ring and they got the Texan guy and they're like, oh, he's a monster and all this. Yeah. The, the commentators. And they look at pride and they're like, oh, you know, he doesn't look up, you know, he doesn't look up too much and all that. And he comes yeah. out and he abolishes him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if straight uh, away, he's, oh. I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the respect he carries. I remember watching a video clip where he walked into a room and GSP was in there, and GSP was starstruck. Now, like, you know, probably GSP, one of the, the biggest names and is one of the greatest fighters. And he's like, he, he nudged me and went, it's, it's Fedor, it's Fedor, and he couldn't wait to get over there and have a photograph. And I just thought, if the arguably one of the greatest fighters pound for pound in the world is Starstruck, he's got to be something special. Oh, he's something special. Definitely my favourite. Ah, oh, brilliant. If um, One question I'm going to ask everybody. If he was matchmaker for the day, and you could match two fighters, not from the same eras, or, or from the same eras, what fight, if he was given... An unlimited budget by Dana White to say you can match whatever fight you want, Mike. What would, who would they be? I'd actually like to see uh, John Phillips versus Manoff. Oh yeah, <laughs> would be a lot of grappling in that, would it? <laughs> That's a great fight. That's a great fight. Great fight. I can't see Manoff getting into um, into the UFC now, though. I think that tight is. Oh. Tight. Oh, and I've seen him in Bellator. And, you know, as great as he was. Now, now, that would be one if you could put it together to prime, you know, John who's currently in his prime against... In his prime, yeah. In his prime. prime. Yeah. That, 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 oh, God. That would be absolutely terrifying to watch. Right. Um, thank you very much for your time, Mike. It's been it's been a great chat. Um, and I think a lot of people enjoy watching this and, and get, you know, get to know you a bit better because you're a scary bloke and they see you on the scene. They're probably... Afraid to say uh, I am and introduce yourself. I think maybe I'm shy. It's just too shy, it is. Yeah, and I think they'll see a different side to you now. You know, I've known you a long time and I've always said to everybody he's a proper gent, you know. Um you're on social media, you on Twitter or, or Instagram or anything like that? Uh just Facebook or so. Right, so they can find you on Facebook. Um and what I'll do um on the final slide, mate, if you send me the details of that chat that you was talking about for mental health, I'll make sure that I put the details of that on. All right. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. All right, then. Thank you, mate. Um, good luck with everything. And hopefully these crazy times of this coronavirus will pass and uh, we can get out. I, I, just finish on. How are you finding that with your, with, with your mental health? Has it affected you being stuck in, stuck in all the time? My mental health has been actually really good since I come out of hospital. Yeah. So I'm wary, as you know, I've had two months of a pretty solid, good state of mind. Yeah. So, you know, I've had adjustments to my medication. Yeah. Hopefully it carries on. Great stuff. Great to hear, but well, I wish you all the best, all right? Yeah. Um, thanks for taking time, and I'll see you soon, buddy. Thanks for having me on, Shake. Cheers.